it's an exciting time in the industry, and so we've brought on new talent, we've invested in data and analytics, we've opened up new offices. That's the job of the insurance industry or reinsurance industry to make sure that they take the information in that makes sense. Some are investing in the equity market to capture the bull run we've had for a number of years. For us it's, it's also chasing the profits where, they, where we believe they, they, they are, understanding the markets that you're dealing with. Frankly, it, it hasn't evolved um, in the same way many other industries have evolved in this digital world. We should be really thinking anew about how the product can be delivered. Now there's an opportunity for a much more interactive relationship, making the insurer much more relevant. Bermuda does a great job of meeting all the OECD standards and that's critically important. You have a service aspect of what you do that's beyond just capital. This is a time for us to show our worth in the market. We are a bit frustrated to have so much that we could do and not find the right ways to approach it. The talent that exists within London, the knowledge, the experience, all of those things are critically important. I think this will sort of start questioning um, the role that insurance has to play and can we do more as a whole sector all over the world. That actually was just to uh, wake up a couple of my colleagues who got a little bit of jet lag. But, uh, anyway, good morning. My name is Nick Chartres Black, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2018 AMBES Reinsurance Briefing. As ever, we appreciate your attendance here on a Sunday morning, but hopefully, it provides a, a useful backdrop to a series of busy uh, bilateral meetings over the uh, days ahead. Now, just looking back to um, Last year, obviously, those clips were from last year, and of course, many of you would have been here as we were wondering whether, I think it was Hurricane Irma, whether Irma was going to go up the west side of uh, Florida or the east side. Um, as it was, it went up the, the west, which I think was uh, less disastrous, but nevertheless, um, clearly a, you know, a significant year for cat events in terms of uh, Harvey, Irma and Maria. And of course, we all know what happened next. Alternative capital uh, took to the hills, never to be seen again unless it was trapped in collateralized pots. Rates soared through 1114, 1.7 renewals, and reinsurer CEOs started murmuring about double-digit ROEs um, for the year ahead. Well, maybe not. To tell you what really happened and what will happen um, and discuss um, really where we stand or see the market standing today, we have three presenters. On my immediate right, um, Bob DeRose, Robert DeRose, who's very much the, uh, I guess, the mastermind behind the presentation, um, heading up our sort of reinsurance centre of excellence in the, uh, in the US. Next to Bob, Tony Dittato, managing director, also based in the US office, who will be uh, talking alongside Bob. And then my close colleague, Greg Carter, MD Analytics for, uh, for London, for the EMEA region, uh, and from the London office, who cover the big four reinsurers. Um, these guys, their day-to-day -day are more involved in the US and Bermuda market. So the, they're going to speak for um, around 45 minutes with the usual um, sort of interactive format, and I guess we'll mainly be taking questions towards the end of the presentation. Um, before passing over to them, I have a couple of other tasks, um, a few more introductions. So in your pack, uh, you will find uh, details of all our delegates here at uh, Monte Carlo this year. I won't introduce everybody to you. Um, just to mention a couple of names, probably well known to you. Uh, Matt Mosher uh, from the US office, Chief Operating Officer. Matt is somewhere in the room. Give us a wave, Matt. Not in the room. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, anyway, Matt is here. And uh, Roger Selleck, Chief Executive Officer for AMBES, NAMIA and Asia Pacific, who is in the room and has given you uh, a wave. Uh, and you obviously get the chance to meet uh, other colleagues um, both today and will be based during the week uh, two floors up from here in uh, Salon Gustav. So uh, if you do want to drop in, then please do. Um, and then I think finally, before I hand over, um, well, a couple of um, admin points. The slides for today will be available tomorrow. They'll be on our website. They'll be emailed around to you if we've got all your details, which hopefully you have if you're, you're here today. Um, and there is the report uh, that backs up the discussion today is in your pack and, again, is available on the, the website. Um, the final thing I wanted to just mention very briefly um, before getting into the meat of the presentation was just to say a few words regarding uh, Brexit um, in relation actually to AMBES. The guys later will talk about 
uh, the impact of Brexit on the industry, particularly the, the kind of London market and what's going on there. Um, but just to make you aware, aware we're also planning for, for Brexit. The, the position is that AMBEST in London, we're currently registered with ESMA, European Securities and Markets Authority. Um, and that means we can provide ratings for use for regulatory purposes throughout the, the EU28, the UK plus the EU27. Um, to maintain that access, um, assuming some form of hard Brexit scenario, we need to have a new registered business uh, within the EU27, and we are uh, in the process of setting up a new subsidiary in Amsterdam. Um, why Amsterdam? I'm sure that's obvious, um, but the official reason uh, is really e ease, of, <laughs> ease of doing business. Um, um, they're very good at speaking English, which is helpful. Um, the, uh, the logistical connectivity with the rest of the EU27, and in terms of the talent pool that it has, itself and as a good centre to attract people both from London and elsewhere in the EU. And uh, we're on schedule to be operational. Um, we're having to assume a hard Brexit by 29th of March uh, 2019 next year. Um, but we'll, we'll keep you updated. There's a page on our website and we'll keep you updated uh, as that uh, progress in that office um, fills out. The, uh, I should have just mentioned the, the new, our new head, analytical head of the office, Angela Yeo, is also here and she's at the back. So uh, if, you, if you want any specific queries on what we're going to be doing in Amsterdam, then talk to uh, Angela. Um, so I'm nearly done. Um, we've just got to spend a few minutes reading through that, but I think we won't. Um, and that one. And then uh, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Bob. Thanks very much, Nick. Uh, this is just a brief discussion outline uh, that we're going to try to touch on various topics this morning, starting with global reinsurance results and trends, then get into some of the issues around market capacity um, and market evolution. I think that you know the market continues to evolve and probably at a more rapid pace today than, than ever before. Uh, and there have been some recent developments there that we're going to touch upon. And then we'll, we'll, we'll conclude with the market segment outlook, but actually we're also going to start with the market segment outlook. Um, and I know that there are various views on the, on the outlook from, from various constituents. Um, quite frankly, we ourselves debated um, this outlook quite, uh, quite aggressively, uh, probably at, you know, starting in January when there was a lot of optimism surrounding what potential may lie ahead following the events of 2017. But then we followed you know, the market uh, developments uh, through, uh, through the January renewals uh, into the mid-year renewals, and um, I think, to say the least, we were quite disappointed, as, as many market participants were, with the way um, pricing terms and conditions developed following those events. And um, when we looked at, you know, looking back and then looking forward in terms of what we feel the market's going to de deliver in terms of returns, and we, that, measuring that and, and at, looking at various um, metrics, combined ratio, ROE, um, we just don't see um, a significant enough of, a, of an improvement to really change our near-term view uh, of the market outlook. So, so we're keeping it at negative. Um, the reasons here, they're, they're outlined on the slide. Obviously, competition continues to be very, very intense. Um, and that is one of the reasons why um, pricing didn't develop as favorably as one would have anticipated. Um, the increasing interest from third-party capital remains. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on around third-party capital, and uh, we're going to touch upon, you know, the recent developments with Apollo uh, acquiring uh, Aspen and also, more significantly, Markel's acquisition of Nafila, which I think is quite very, very interesting for the market and what might my, my lie ahead. Um, earnings did stabilize, uh, but they certainly remain under pressure. Um, favorable reserve development is still a very, very significant component of uh, the report, reported um, results, um, and this is this is really the key point. It's it's excess capacity. It remains very very prevalent, and it's really what hindered um, the improvement following the events of 17. 17. Um, potential for increased inflation, um, certainly also a potential negative, and I think that you know we're seeing that more so in the U.S. with rising inf in inflation or rising interest rates, excuse me, and um, the, um, we're going we're to touch upon some uh, economic 
uh, um, information in the next few slides, and we'll get a little bit deeper into that. In terms of the, the, the tailwinds uh, and the positives, certainly session rates uh, increased following the events of 17. Uh, U.S. tax reform played some role in that as well. We saw a lot of affiliated reinsurance, which was affiliated reinsurance, being placed with third parties in order to um, get around the, uh, the tax ramifications in the U.S. Um, and as we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, cap losses did help stabilize rates, uh, but not significantly enough. Um, favorable reserve development, still very, very present. Uh, had historically run around six points on the combined ratio. We see that tapering back a bit. And um, through the half year, interestingly enough, we did see more um, issues with uh, unfavorable development than we had in recent history. So that's kind of a significant issue uh, that, we're, that we're remaining focused on. Um, the strong risk adjusted capital, that obviously aligns with the excess capacity in the market. Balance sheets still remain, remain very, very strong. Uh, and uh, quite honestly, it's alleviating any, any rating pressures. So it's interesting, we do have a segment outlook. That is not a rating outlook. Uh, I would say that the rating outlook and most of the, most of the outlooks on all of our rated reinsurers are stable. There are a few negatives, but very, very few at this juncture. And quite honestly, I don't see um, any significant reason to believe that we're going to have any material change in our view of individual ratings over the near term. Um, and then increased interest rates, obviously that plays uh, a long, uh, over the long term, that's a positive. It should bode well for, for the bottom line. It creates some near-term issues in terms of unrealized losses, which actually helps offset some of the capacity issues, but not materially enough. And then also M&A, we're gonna to touch upon that. Uh, given where the dynamics are in the market, we believe M&A is gonna continue over the near term and may take various forms. Certainly the Markel Nafila transaction, I think was somewhat of a surprise to us as it was probably to, to many. So um, that's where we are with the outlook. Um, basically, this, I, I guess this summarizes the, the issue down the bottom. Although capac capitalization remains strong, rate deterioration temporarily uh, halted, pressure on margins continues, and that's the, really the key and the reason behind our negative outlook for the sector. So now we're going to get into some global reinsurance results and trends, and we're going to start with really a view of what's going on in the global economy, and we're going to start with the U.S. since it's one of the largest economies uh, in the world. And I think that there's a favorable story here, at least on the surface, uh, U.S. GDP growth, um, inflation, and unemployment pretty much have all been um, trending favorably. Um, inflation seems to be ticking up a bit more recently. Um, the um, August job report, or, or labor report, um, indicated you know, continued improvement in the labor market in the U.S., the, the unemployment rate is, is around 4%, which really is, by many, many economists, consider that to be full employment. Um, but for the first time, we're seeing wage inflation. So that's an interesting development. And if that continues, obviously, it's going to um, continue to dictate future uh, interest rate increases by the Federal Reserve. Um, but the, um, the GDP growth certainly... Um, has been favorable as the consumer price index as, as, as well in the first half. Um, in terms of central banks lending rates, uh, here you can see that the U.S. is obviously um, has, the, has, the, has the, the, the good amount of momentum. That's that purple uh, line. Um, and uh, there's every reason to believe that that's going to continue to trend upward. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, over the long term, that's a positive for the bottom line but may cause a little bit of um, heartburn in terms of uh, unrealized losses in the fixed income portfolio. Um, the global GDP growth for major economies, the forecast seems to have everything pretty much in line. So where the U.S. has been improving, and it's hard to distinguish these lines because they're all kind of blurring together, um, but um, the forecast pretty much has uh, the world going along at a pretty consistent pace. Um, and uh, in terms of what that means for the reinsurance market, if the global economy is stable to improving, then obviously that can present more opportunities for um, risk transfer going forward. 
So now we're going to kind of focus on some specifics as pertain to the global reinsurance market. And we're really going to take a look back to 2017 and, and what, what it meant. And I think that Nick alluded to it in his opening comments. Certainly immediately following the events, uh, there seemed to be a little bit of, I'll use the word euphor euphoria. Um, I remember some CEOs being quite optimistic about what it was going to mean uh, for the market. Uh, the, big the big question and the big uncertainty was really around alternative capital and how that was going to respond to, to the events. And I think that there was some degree of skepticism that, um, you know, it would um, be replenished and um, that it would um, be available for, for deployment at, at January 1. Um, I think everyone was, uh, was a little bit fooled by that and um, the, the alternative capital actually did respond in a very favorable way. Um, well, I, in, I, I yeah. think there's probably a lot of traditional capital providers were hoping that alternative capital would run for the hills. Yep. And a lot of disappointed people. Absolutely, there's no question. So the events, you know, certainly sizable in terms of their totality, 80 to 100 billion. Um, and they occurred rather late in the year, which um, we felt might have made, made the lost estimations um, uh, more uncertain because of the short period of time reinsurers had to um, you know, pull together their estimates. But interestingly enough, while there have been a few negative reserve surprises, uh, there haven't been many. So I, I guess that that's good news for the market overall. Um, so what, what, what 2017 really translated into was more of an earnings event than a capital event. Alternative capital did participate in the events in a meaningful way. Are, but it really didn't result in any hindrance uh, for them coming in to uh, meet the demands of the 1-1 and the mid-year renewals, as many were, 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 were anticipating. Um, when you look at how the losses were spread, and this is in, in rough terms, you know, um, we, we believe that about 50% of that went to the, to the reinsurance sector, and it was a 60-40 split between traditional and non-traditional uh, uh, capital that, that backed the losses, 40% going to the alternative market. So they did participate in a, reasonable, in, in a reasonable way. So optimism obviously faded pretty quickly following the January renewals, but optimism remained through the, through the mid-year, and then uh, following the mid-year is when really the bottom fell out and everybody lost uh, any, any hope for any significant or material improvement in overall market conditions. And I think that that's more or less when we decided that we probably would stay negative with our outlook rather than go stable. So when we look at the, at the economic losses in 17, uh, you know, certainly, um, certainly material events. Um, we always look at the economic losses relative to the insured losses. And you can see that uh, for all of 17, the NAT cat losses came in at about 131 billion, uh, you know, somewhere between 80 and 100 billion are, relate to the, to the events in the US. That includes the wildfires, as well as the three hurricanes. And then you also have the, uh, the earthquake that occurred in Mexico. Uh, but the spread between economic losses and, and insured losses still remains pretty wide, which quite honestly um, should indicate that there is opportunity out there for, um, for the reinsurance to, to participate in, 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 the, um, in, in these uh, events in a more material way going forward. Uh, when you compare 17 to the historical 10-year average, um, certainly it was a, a material loss year, um, and certainly in comparison to 16 it was as well. And for 18, it's obviously an undetermined hurricane. Uh, Lane went through missed Hawaii, which could have been a significant event. There are three teed up in the Atlantic for this year already with uh, Florence, Isaac, and Helene uh, determining where it's going. Florence now looks like it's gonna be an East Coast event. So it's, uh, it has been, from a hurricane perspective, a slow start of the season, but September is the pickup month. And uh, we're already seeing a very active season. And so it, uh, those numbers are gonna change pretty dramatically uh, over the next couple of months. And I think that the models are saying that it will hit as a category four. They're projecting right, right now, and we have some modeling firms out here if they want to chime in as a, mm -hmm. uh, a, cat, a major event, a cat three into a three, uh, a three. the Carolinas. Okay. So it's yet to be determined. Yeah. 
So this is both a look back, uh, gives a five-year average, and I'll give some indication of what we think all of 18 is going to look like. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's interesting, you know, it's hard to distinguish the trend on this chart because the, the bars seem to, they're, they're moving upwards, but very subtly. So I'm going to throw some numbers out there uh, just to make it a little bit more um, clear. When you look at 2013, the combined ratio there was an 87.8. The trend has been a deterioration all the way through 16 with a 95.3. Now, obviously, 17 was impacted by the events, which came in at a 110. But if you were to remove um, the CAT impact, which we think is around 14 or 15 points, again, the deterioration between 16 and 17 wasn't that significant, around 95, 96% on a normalized basis. But factor in the favorable reserve development, which has been running about between five and six points, um, you know, you're, you're really producing close to 100 combined ratios, which isn't nearly, um, uh, you know, significant or, or, or good enough to, to support the, the bottom line. Um, and looking forward, uh, we, you know, again, assuming that we have a normal cat year for 18, we're projecting 18 to come in at a 94.8. Uh, and that probably includes between uh, four and five points of favorable reserve development. And the other thing to, to focus in on is not just the deterioration in the loss reserve or, or the loss ratio, but also the deterioration in expenses, which is something that the industry <coughs> continues to grapple with as far as increasing the efficiency and reducing cost. I mean, I think that the other issue with expenses is that the reinsurance industry is faced with the need to invest in their future. Uh, and um, certainly the larger players are making significant investments in technology and um, finding ways to try to support their clients with insure tech uh, solutions. So uh, it's, it, is, it is a very difficult balance to maintain. Um, moving forward, this is just a different picture of, of the combined ratio, but trying to give you a view of how the different segments within the reinsurance sector performed. Uh, and, you know, it is a syndicated business, and they generally perform um, relatively closely. Uh, the standout here um, in 17 was really Lloyd's, which um, unfortunately distinguished itself in an unfavorable way relative to uh, the other two sectors. And, and again, uh, you know, historically, Bermuda and cat years, U.S. and Bermuda and cat years has generally underperformed the European Big Four because of the concentration in property cat. But I think what we're seeing is, is as, those, as those Bermuda organizations, you know, diversify themselves, I mean, there really are very, very few property cat specialists left, rated specialists left in, in Bermuda. They're pretty much well diversified uh, and have uh, the opportunity to access casualty markets around the world. Uh, you're seeing a closer alignment in, in the ratios between the U.S. and Bermuda and the European Big Four and the performance on a combined ratio basis. I don't know if you want to add anything on Lloyd's at this point or you want to save that. I'll, I'll come back to it later, okay. but just to add that Lloyd's traditionally has you know, underperformed during cat years, as you said, and outperformed mm -hmm. during good years. Um, what you've seen actually on this chart shows that the outperformance during the good years has, has not been that significant which is partly a reflection that most of those, those five years there, excluding 2017, were not great years for the industry. They were the, the tail end of a, a, a good period. Right. So this takes a look at the uh, return on equity uh, for, the, for, for, the, for the global reinsurance market. And obviously this, is, I think, says it probably better than any slide in the deck. When you look at the ROE performance, it's been a constant state of deterioration over the five-year period. Um, the, the green bar is, is the five-year average, which is running around 8%, which is where we forecast the full year 2018 to come in as well. Uh, when you consider the average cost of capital for a reinsurer at about somewhere between 7 and 8%, some experts say it's around 7.5%. I mean, the reinsurers are struggling really to cover their cost of capital, and we think that that's going to uh, remain an issue over the near term. Um, I think to some degree, this is probably what is dictating the need for, and we're seeing it, 
an alignment, a better alignment with uh, alternative capital. Uh, and again, um, you know, that is a cheaper form of capital. Uh, if used properly, it can be a source of fee income with, you know, limited or no risk, uh, which obviously helps the sector improve its, its, its capital efficiency. So that's a dynamic I think that we're going to see continue over the near term and probably the longer term as well. And again, this is the, the look at the ROE by, by sector. Um, again, on, Lloyd's distinguished itself in an unfavorable way. Um, and I think that you know, the, the capital structure at Lloyd's magnifies uh, the impact both on a positive and a negative way, depending on the circumstances in, in the year. Um, US and Bermuda and, and European more aligned, but the Europeans uh, obviously have the benefit, generally speaking, of, of, of diversification from being composite organizations both with both life and non-life, and uh, a very, very large asset base supporting the life reserves, which really helps serve as ballast to absorb uh, the lost impact from the property casualty operations. So that's why they're able to, um, to, re to generate a positive ROE, although not a very good one, in, in, a, in a significant cat year. Just, just to add one, just to point out one thing, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, because of that capital structure at Lloyd's, if they want to, if syndicates want to continue writing the same level of exposure, the same volumes of business, they need to replenish that capital at the at the year end, the coming into line process, the annual venture process, it means that Lloyd's, in order to trade forward at the, with the same volumes, needs to recapitalise, and that, that's one of the key features of the Lloyd's market. Now, I, I, I like this slide. Um, because I think it really gets to the point. It, it's comparing the uh, five-year, and keep in mind this is a five-year average ROE for year-end 16 compared to year-end 17, and it compares it both including the benefit of favorable reserve development and excluding the benefit of favorable reserve development. And... Um, I tend to focus on the ROE excluding the favorable reserve development to try to get an idea of what the current market conditions are, are producing. Um, so, you know, for 17, the five-year average, obviously the deterioration was driven by the impact of the 2017 CAT events, uh, is down to 4.5%. And I think that that tells uh, you know, the story that there needs to be improvement in, in pricing conditions you know, uh, for the market really to sustain itself over the longer term. Now we're going to get into the reinsurance market capacity. Um, you know, this slide illustrates or comes from our ranking of the top 50 global reinsurers. And um, we, we look at the changes in the rankings every year. And um, one thing that is pretty certain is, is that the, the top 10 will probably always be the top 10. You may see movement within it, uh, as we did this year with Munich taking the number one position over Swiss Re. Um, and the major reason for that is, is that Swiss Re non-renewed uh, a material quota share with AIG. Um, and also, um, Swiss Re reports in U.S. dollars, Munich reports in euros, and there was some exchange rate uh, um, benefit for Munich that, that helped lift them to the, to, to, to the first uh, position. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway moved up significantly in the rankings this year, uh, largely because of the LPT and adverse development cover that was provided to AIG. Um, again, that's a one-shot deal, so they'll probably drop in the ranking unless another material opportunity presents itself this year. Um, in terms of the uh, global life uh, reinsurers, uh, that's been pretty consistent year to year. Uh, Munich, Munich has pretty much always held the number one position uh, in the life reinsurance space. Now. This is also a very interesting slide, and one we've shown in past years. Um, you know, when you look at the top 10, they're controlling 70% of the uh, gross written premium. Um, and again, this is one of the reasons why they will remain dominant, because of their, of their leading market share position. And um, I don't imagine that there would be, um, 
And when you look at those, those larger organizations, I, I guess you have to question, they really don't need to do M&A, but certainly in the tier two, tier three, and certainly tier four, that is probably where you're gonna see more M&A activity as really they uh, try to find ways to remain relevant to the market and, and gain scale. Now we're gonna get into some of the um, alternative capital. Um, and here, you know, when you look at the, at the growth, it's very, very obvious that the more pronounced growth has come in the, in the, in the alternative or the convergence capital uh, category. Um, rated balance sheets pretty much have remained flat and I think that the, the major reason for that is to some extent they're managing their capital quite deliberately utilizing share buybacks and uh, in some cases extraordinary dividends um, to um, you know take it they have excess capital they recognize that the op market opportunities aren't significant enough for them to hold the capital so they're returning it to shareholders um, and depending on their stock price, that probably may, that may make the most, the most economic sense, given where market conditions are. But in terms of the alternative capital, and again, let's talk about this Markel Nafila uh, announcement. Um, you know, Nef Markel owned previously, I think it's about a year ago, acquired CACO, maybe it's a little bit longer than that. Um, CACO ha has about $6 billion of assets under management. Nafila was about $12 billion. You put those together, and now Nafila represents close to 20% of the alternative capital. So that alignment between convergence capital and traditional capital, I think, is quite significant for the market. It's really, you know, and it's an evolution that, that probably will continue. We saw Aspen's acquisition of, um, of Aspen, and um, if you look back a little bit further, you know, um, uh, Canadian Teachers Pensions uh, acquired Ascot from AIG several years ago. So this, this, this seems to be an evolution that's starting to take hold. And the alignment of the, of, the, of the traditional capital with the alternative capital, I think, paints the way forward for more efficient capital use by traditional players, which may help to bring their cost of capital down. And while we're forecasting somewhat of a static um, Im improvement in terms of ROE, what may improve is, is, the, is the utilization of capacity or, or capital. And if that improves and brings the cost of capital down, that could actually be one of the drivers for us going stable on the outlook uh, over, over the next year or two. Uh, time will tell, but uh, I, think, I, think it's an actual, I think it's a significant positive for the market. This is just giving us an idea of you know, how the alternative or convergence capital is, is deployed. And as you, as you can see, about $71 billion is through a dedicated insurance linked security ILS managers such as Nafila. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the top 10 players in this sector, and you know, it's Nafila at the top, Credit Suisse, LGT, Stone Ridge, Securus, Fremont, Mark Kells, CACO is in there, uh, Lead Hall, Aeolus, and um, I can't read that last one. <laughs> I know the others by heart, and I don't need the glasses, but. But um, they controlled 68 billion of the 100 billion. So just like the, the top 10 global reinsurers control the, the, the lion's share of the market, it's, it's, it's also true of the alternative <coughs> uh, capacity providers. Um, then you have the reinsurance sponsored managers, uh, and those are like the likes of um, the one most obvious one is, is Everest and. Um, um, Well, Ren, I guess Ren, obviously, and it's, it's but um, I'm trying to think of Everest's, uh, not Mount Logan, is it? Yes. What was it? Mount Logan. So, I'm sorry, getting old. Um, but, um, you know, obviously, the uh, rated capacity is going to be increasing in terms of size um, as they align themselves more closely with the alternative capital. Um, and... Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this slide develops and looks next year. Now we're going to get into the market evolution, which I've touched upon briefly by some of the more recent events. Um, but again, I thought that this, this was an interesting slide if you, t if you take a, a look back over 10 years' time. Um, 
You know, the global franchises, as I mentioned, uh, remain pretty consistent. And um, I would venture to guess that they're going to be, you know, there t next year and for many years to come. But what has been interesting is to look at the increase in the number of franchises that have basically sought shelter. Um, and what I mean by that is, is they're not publicly traded any, any longer. Uh, and I think the reason for that is, is you know, if you're going to ge generate a 7 or an 8% ROE, is that really sufficient to satisfy your, 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 your shareholder constituency? And the answer is, is no. And uh, they seek shelter under a, the umbrella of a larger, more diversified um, organization. Um, Partner, which is relatively recently acquired by XOR, I guess, two years ago, uh, that, is a, that is truly a, a conglomerate. They're, they're a non-insurance parent. Uh, they're an investment um, holding company. Um, and, you know, you think about National Indemnity and Genry, who have been owned by Berkshire Hathaway for a very, very long period of time. Um, and quite honestly, they're, they're, they've been excellent in terms of cycle management. They really don't have to be focused on the top line or the bottom line, for that matter. So they, you know, National Indemnity can book uh, a rather large LPT, and, which is to the detriment of their bottom line, and they really don't have to be, con be concerned about it because, you know, it's, um, it's, it's absorbed by, by a very, very diversified uh, conglomerate pa parent, Berkshire Hathaway. But all of these organizations have basically short sh shelter um, in order to allow them um, the ability, basically, to, to better manage the cycle um, and be less concerned about... Um, you know, or answering to, to external shareholders. Um, and then there's the franchises that no longer exist, and I think that the interesting thing here, they, it's quite obvious, is, is that most of these were property cat specialists, and you really just can't be a property cat specialist anymore. You have to be a more diversified uh, participant in the market in order to manage the, the volatility and, and the market cycle. And then the question is, is what does the future hold? You know, we see, we've seen a number of new company formations and a few of these are actually in or part of alternative capital. Humboldt Re, Calvin Re, Lumen Re. Um, and you might even say, you know, the, the, the hedge fund sponsored or uh, um, aligned entities, Third Point, Harrington, uh, Greenlight, um, you know, Watford. They, uh, they um, are obviously in the market. Um, many of them are, have actually made um, our top 50 ranking, Greenlight is in the top 50, as is Third Point. Um, so, you know, they are gaining scale, and um, I think it's still early days to see whether or not they uh, can make a significant mark uh, on the segment. Um, but they, they are existing, and um, they're trying to find ways to um, become more relevant to the market. Um, there's obviously been some issues around maidenry. That's why it's in what does the future hold. I think you know it's still early days in terms of you know what their future. And I don't think anyone can really predict. But obviously they're facing some significant challenges. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything more to add there. So the case for M and A, uh, and I think that this story remains the same, um, and it's going to continue to um, dictate the future to some degree. Um, obviously, the drivers are broader market cap capability, um, broader geographic reach, greater influence, and greater attractiveness to alternative capital. I think all of those themes remain true today, and they're probably more important than ever. Uh, you have to find opportunities for growth. You have to find ways to sustain yourself over the long term. And there have been a number of examples of you know, organizations that have you know, brought themselves together just basically to, to achieve one or more of these goals. And you have Renry and Platinum, Endurance Sampo, XL Catlin. And then alternatively, you know, strategic, you know, you might consider, you know, the XOR partner, uh, you know, obviously X partner was a, was a strategic acquisition for XOR. Uh, and I would say that the Markel, uh, Catco, and Affila are, are strategic in terms of, you know, them gaining the ability to take advantage of alternative capital and the fee income that that uh, type of business strategy produces. And even the AIG Validus, I think that, you know, um, uh, the, that, that was a strategic acquisition for, for AIG. AIG is a pretty, you know, despite all of the issues around AIG, there's still very much a global organization, a very well diversified organization 
Validus really doesn't add much value in that, but it does give them the ability, quite frankly, to also access alternative capital. And Brian Dupereau was recently mentioned in the press as saying that he sees great opportunities in deploying or utilizing alternative capital as a risk management tool and diversification tool going forward. So Validus could certainly play a role in that. Um, so again, I think that this states the obvious. You know, alternative capital continues to drive a great deal of structural change in the market. However, the market continues to be heavily influenced by the global leaders such as Swiss, Munich, Hanover, Score, Everest Partner, and forgive me if I miss any, anyone else in the top 10, but uh, you know, those leaders are going to remain dominant going forward and over the near term. Now, this is obviously um, a slide that we've used in the past and again continues to remain very, very uh, true today and probably more so, is, is that there's definitely a drive to uh, become more efficient in terms of distribution. And all of the players along this uh, you know, con uh, continuum here are trying to find ways to get closer and harness and, um, and basically control the client. Um, Convergence Capital has done it by, you know, having or owning or having a, a very strong relationship with an MGA and using a front, you know, in between it. So again, trying to access the client in a more direct way rather than relying on an independent source for, for, for business opportunities. Um, and um, in reinsurers, to, to, a, to a greater extent, are really developing in sure tech uh, um, initiatives to basically find ways to um, position themselves better with their seeding clients. So, you know, when you, when you think about personal lines and even small commercial, InsureTech is becoming a necessity. You have to find ways to make it easier for the customer to buy insurance. And a smaller player may not have the capital resources or the technology resources to basically build that on their own. And the larger reinsurers, either doing it directly or through a partner, are developing these technology, technological capabilities and basically providing it to their clients so that they can in, in, in become more aligned with their client and, um, and make it more difficult for them to um, choose another reinsurer over, um, over themselves. So this is a, an area that continues, and I think is going to. We're going to see that trend ev continue to evolve. Yeah, I guess just one thing to add on that. I, I suppose that that traditional chain has been in place for many, many years. The convergence yes. capital is, is perhaps the newest element to it. But the idea of players trying to short circuit that that process and trying to get closer to the client, trying to take cost out of the business, ha, ha, is not new. That that's been an effort in various areas that's been underway for some time. And that contrasts, I think, with the slide you put up about expenses that shows that yeah. despite all of those efforts, mm -hmm. there's really been no cost taken out of the industry in that well, sense. Well, that, that is a, a very good point. And I just met with a company last week, and it happened to be a primary insurer that has made substantial investments themselves in an app. They, it's, small, it's small commercial. It seems to be working quite well. But you ask them the question, OK, it's creating greater efficiency for the agent, the broker, or in this case, it was a wholesaler. Uh, so the question was, is, well, are you reducing your commission or your compensation to that producer for the efficiencies that they gain? And the answer was no. Because there's somebody out there who will pay them uh, a higher commission if, 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 they were, if, if they felt that, it, you know, that, hey, I'm taking cost out, let me cut your commission. Uh, people want to be paid for the business that they're bringing to you. So it's going to be a struggle. And we, we saw that uh, what, 20 odd years ago with, with Direct Line in the UK. The, the idea was to cut out brokers for motor insurance. And they did cut out brokers. And what they saved on brokerage, they spent on advertising. So uh, for the customer, it was, there, was no, there was no real gain. Yeah. So this is the, the evolution that's, that's really been occurring and probably will continue to occur, occur. You know, probably 10 years ago, really, you know, I would say following 9-11 um, uh, with the birth, you know, the Bermuda class of 01, uh, you know, you saw the, 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 the dual platform emerge where you have a reinsurer, you know, companioned with, it, with a primary business. And, uh, you know, the, back then, having both insurance and reinsurance capabilities was sold as, you know, giving us the opportunity to cycle manage 
better over the long term. Um, then you had you know, increased um, participation and utilization of alternative capital. And I think that that is going to be an area that's going to continue and probably take more prominence going forward. And then obviously the need for, for M&A, which we pointed out already, is really a matter of relevance and size. Uh, uh, you, know, you, need to, you need to be able to have that but while you know, remaining small enough to be nimble and um, also possibly seek parental protection as a sheltered entity. Now, it's not all bad news, I guess. I mean, there are opportunities out there. Um, everybody talks about cyber. Um, but it's interesting. Um, I think most reinsurers that are in the space feel they have to be there or they will be left behind. But I think that they're the first to admit that it is obviously a relatively new class of business, one that has a lot of uncertainty and unknowns ar around it. And uh, it's very, very important um, because of the relative, relative immaturity of, of modeling, there, is, there are models out there, but none of them have really been tested. You know, you need to control your aggregate accumulations and you need to do a lot of uh, scenario analysis in order to see, well, what, what the worst case uh, circumstance be uh, should uh, a global cyber event occur? How would, you, how, how, would, how would an organization be impacted? And we have pretty robust dialogue with our rated entities around this issue uh, because it is a relatively new um, an emerging area, you know, uh, obviously we want to know what the, what the downside can be from a cyber event if, if, if they're putting out cyber limits. Flood, um, you know, obviously the, the, the um, National Flood Insurance Program in, in the, in the uh, U.S. Is, is utilizing and buying more traditional and alternative reinsurance protection, uh, more so than it ever has, and uh, the uh, the, the, the traditional reinsurers have certainly stepped up um, and um, are, are providing capacity for flood. Um, I don't think it's, you know, certainly the, the first year of that program was not profitable. Um, but um, again, I think that everybody recognizes that the, um, that the private sector needs to play an increasing role in, in, in the flood um, uh, market. Uh, U.S. mortgage, obviously another area that has uh, grown in prominence uh, over the past several years. Um, there are about 25 markets, I believe, that are currently providing capacity in, in, this, in this segment. And, and the underwriting conditions right now are very, very attractive. But again, this is a very, very long tail class of business. And it's also very, very sensitive to the economy. Uh, once you're on risk, you're on risk. You know, you go on uh, while market conditions are favorable and the, and the, and the uh, economic environment is good. But, you know, should, that, should the economic environment deteriorate and, and uh, losses emerge, you're pretty much uh, attached and, 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 you, and you're going to have to uh, absorb those losses. So, again, I think that most people who are in this space are controlling their, um, their, their limits exposed uh, as the primary risk management tool. Uh, terrorism, uh, it's been around for a while. Again, my, my understanding is, is that this has generally been profitable. Um, uh, but again, it's, uh, it's something that we, we actually do have a terror stress test that we, that we utilize. Uh, we're very, very conscious of, of um, the exposure that it brings to a balance sheet. And we, we want to understand you know, how these uh, risks accumulate um, you know, against a, a, given, a given insurer or reinsurer. I already talked about insure tech. Uh, I think that that's going to be a buzzword uh, certainly here going forward. Um, and again, it's very, very important uh, for reinsurers to, to be involved in some way in order to um, remain uh, closer uh, to, to the client. And then U.S. tax reform, um, it obviously impacted uh, the Bermuda uh, reinsurers in a more significant way because there was a significant amount of um, affiliated reinsurance from the U.S. Uh, to, the, uh, to the Bermuda balance sheet. We obviously saw a significant restructuring there. Um, that um, that, that is, I think, worked itself through. Um, but also, interestingly enough, uh, those organizations, um, multinationals that utilized uh, reinsurance uh, you know, to their European uh, parent, uh, there's been some restructuring there, and we've actually seen it uh, present some opportunities to uh, unaffiliated reinsurers to take up 
the uh, uh, capacity lost as a result of U.S. tax reform, the internal capacity utilization from U.S. tax reform. Just two points on, on the flood and terrorism in the, in the U.S. It's, it's a very political type of programs, and every year or every couple of years when flood comes up, it is debated, and it takes a long time to get it passed. And terrorism will come up in 2020 uh, at the end of the year. So in the current environment, and this is not a political statement in the U.S., we don't know the longevity of those programs and, and what form they will take in the future. So those are things or opportunities um, if you can get the pricing what it needs to be. So now we're going to take a look at London and regional markets. I'm going to... Like Greg handle this. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. So just a few comments really on, on the Lloyd's market, given its its prominence in the in the reinsurance sector. This slide, um, there's a lot of information on here, so just to briefly explain it, the, the, the two blue bars are talking about 2016 and the red and green are 2017. And the dark blue is uh, the accident year 2016 results. Uh, the lighter blue, lighter blue shows the benefits of res prior year reserve releases. Uh, and I guess so, so the key message to really to pick out from this is it broken down by the key lines of business that Lloyds writes. Um, the key message really is that in 2017, the accident year results are uh, above 100% combined ratios in all classes of business. Uh, and that's um, you know, highlighted by some of the earlier slides. So that clearly shows some of the pressures that that market is under. And it's not just a property cap exposure. It's, it's across all lines of business. Obviously, you, you could point to the fact that 2017 was a bad year. Um, the, the cat losses for Lloyd's added 18.5% to their combined ratio in 2017. And it's important to point out that that's not out, out of line with expectations. De depending on how you modelled the events of, of last year, um, if you look at the losses across the industry as a whole, then um, indications from the modelling firms that uh, and, and many of the companies that we speak to suggest that those losses for 2017 were in line with uh, a, a, somewhere between a 1 in 12 and 1 in 15 year event. Uh, and even if you look just at the US exposures, then you're probably looking at a 1 in 25 year event. So they're, they're, they're not that unusual and, and not to be expected. Uh, as I mentioned though, the, you know, the, the, the run rate for all, lines of business, all major lines of business at Lloyd's is, is now above 100% combined. And uh, I mean, the, the, uh, John Hancock heading the, um, the performance management team there is taking action. And it, it's very difficult from the outside to see how effective that is. And clearly, uh, changing underwriting results doesn't happen overnight. What, what is clear, though, is we can see that there are a number of syndicates pulling out various lines of business. Now, is that, is that down to Mr. Hancock's activities, or is it syndicates themselves realizing that? these lines of business are unprofitable. Um, but it is clear that the, the screw is being turned, but to turn results around will take many years. That's actually you know, a very important point to emphasize because that's actually very favorable for the overall market. Uh, obviously, um, if capacity becomes tighter at Lloyd's, it can translate into better opportunities and better pricing uh, you know, for, the larger, for, the market, for the market at large. So. Yeah. I guess the, the, the question then is if there's a, a tightening of standards and a, a focus on underwriting at Lloyd's, how much of an impact does that have on the market? And how much does a, would a, a shrinkage in alternative capital have on the, have on the marketplace in terms of adjusting pricing? Uh, answers on a postcard, please. Um, so uh, just to highlight some of the challenges, clearly you know, all lines of business are facing extreme competition. Um, Lloyd's has traditionally had an expense ratio that's higher than the market, and that's very definitely the case now. Um, and that, that, that difference is, is probably w wider than it's ever been. Um, Lloyd's does face the challenge of uh, the growth of other regional hubs that perhaps would slow or prevent some of the flow of business that traditionally would have come to Lloyd's. And that, that business traditionally would have been more profitable. Uh, and then internally, the, Lloyd's is facing the challenge of, of re reviewing its own structure, trying, trying again to manage its own expenses uh, and the target operating model that, uh, that they're trying to implement there. Uh, and of course, we've seen the de departure of a number of senior positions within the Lloyd's market. 
Um, the chairman has not been there that long. The, the, the CEO, we have a new CEO joining fairly soon. Um, we have uh, the CFO position becoming vacant and the chief commercial officer and head of, the, of Lloyd's Brussels um, has also announced his departure, uh, Vincent van Dahl, to, to Everest Re. So th there's a, a bit of a, a change at the top and I, I think it, it raises the question about the position of Lloyd's in the marketplace and, and what does the corporation of Lloyd's provide uh, and, and what, what, does, what does the future of the market hold? And you can take a, a, a very skeptical view and say since the advent of corporate capital Lloyd's has been on a transition to becoming ultimately a trade association. Um, I, I think that's too extreme but I think there are those pressures. If you go back pre-corporate capital this was a market that was supported largely by innocent capacity, innocent capital and the role of the, 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 the central body at Lloyd's was to provide direction and control you've now got a marketplace that is increasingly, a, a, it's, it's a, a collection of a small group of large players that are dancing to their own tune, they, they, they're satisfying their own shareholders. So um, yeah, John Neal has taken on a, a pretty tough challenge I think in terms of, of where, does, where does Lloyd strategically <coughs> position itself in the marketplace. And of course there's the, the small issue of Brexit to deal with. Um, which for Lloyd's, uh, they, they've solved in terms of access to business through the creation of Lloyd's Brussels, um, which we assigned a rating to earlier this year. Um, Lloyd's hasn't addressed, um, uh, at least not publicly, one of the other issues that, that does affect many of the UK companies, and I'll come back to that in a second. But just to talk about how uh, particularly the UK companies are responding to Brexit, we've seen a number of company establishments in Europe as companies position themselves in order to continue to access that European business that, may not, that uh, they may not be licensed to write as a UK company going forward. And we've seen companies set up in a, a number of jurisdictions. Um, this chart here, uh, the, the size of the boxes indicates the, the number of establishments uh, of companies that have set up um, EU27 based subsidiaries uh, and Ireland and Luxembourg uh, are, are clearly the bigger winners. Um, there's a lot of factors that have gone into why companies have chosen each of these venues. Um, it could be tax issues, it could be their view of the regulatory <coughs> regime within those territories, it could be access to their clients and client pro proximity, or a view on their access to talent. Um, I, I think if you look at it a little bit deeper, what you will see is a, a strong correlation between where companies have had existing operations and where they choose then to, to beef up. So um, if, if you've got a branch in Munich, for example, uh, you're likely to then beef up that and convert that into a subsidiary, which is, which is what we've seen. Um, so so the, other, the other factor that um, setting up a subsidiary gives you access to business going forward, but what it doesn't do is deal with your existing liabilities um, and, and the question of whether you can continue to pay those liabilities in the future, um, which has been a, a big issue. And we've seen a number of companies um, through those uh, establishments then trying to execute Part 7 transfers to, to move their U, uh, EU27 liabilities into those entities so they can continue to pay. Um, that, that, an is, that is an issue that I believe is still outstanding for Lloyds uh, and outstanding for a, a fair number of companies. There's, there's something like 70 Part 7 transfers going through the courts at the moment. They are a lengthy process and for companies that are not well into that process already, they're unlikely to be in a position to, to um, operate fully post uh, a hard Brexit on the 29th of March of next year. So really just to, to highlight, uh, I think what um, the, that, uh, just jumping back, that, what that slide shows though, that companies have chosen different solutions, different locations for their Brexit solutions. And I think that's, that's actually a positive thing for the Lloyds market, the London market, because there's no one single hub within the European market that's likely to compete with Lloyds. So, so I think the future, the, the future for Lloyds and the London market, while, whilst not as rosy as it could have been, um, it will not, not lead to a sudden death. So with that, I hand back to Bob to summarize. Yeah. So we're back to the outlook. Uh, we pretty much touched on uh, each of these points um, in the beginning, but also throughout the presentation. Um, and again, you know, at this juncture, we just don't see our way clear to move the outlook to stable. 
Although I will admit that it's a very, very fluid market. Things change and they can change rather quickly, either positively or negatively. So we're, we're continuing to um, monitor this circumstance. As I said, if I were to, if I, if I had a very reliable forecasting tool, I think that you know, ROEs are probably gonna remain somewhere in the mid to high single digits over the longer term where I think the opportunity lies for the, the reinsurance model of today is finding ways to become more capital efficient. And um, through that mechanism, continue to remain viable and attractive to external shareholders. Um, so we'll have to see how that plays out. Great. Nick? Okay, um, thanks guys. We've, um, we've got a little bit of time uh, now for uh, the Q&A. Um, there's a couple of microphones, but anybody like to uh, kick off? Uh, there's one down here about, please, John. Hi, thank, thank you, Robert. John Hewitt-Jones from the Insurance Insider. Um, you, you talked briefly about M&A for tier, tier 2 and Tier 3 companies. Um, I wondered if you could say a bit more about how you feel transactions that we're seeing at the moment, or potential transactions, like the score and the Covert bid we, uh, bid we saw last week, how, that, how uh, transactions like that will, could affect um, ratings and solvency of the companies, those two tier two, tier three companies you rate. Well, first of all, I, I don't think that any organization is gonna enter into any type of M&A if it any way in jeopardizes their solvency or their rating. They're going to, if anything, they're gonna, they're gonna enter into a transaction uh, with uh, a perspective of trying to improve both. Uh, they're both critical to, to be viable. Uh, and um, if, if, if there were any doubt that, uh, if, 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 an, if a transaction were to put either of those two issues into doubt, I don't think that the, that the transaction would, would be successful. It, it wouldn't come to market. Um, I do think that, you know, in terms of, again, there's no way to be certain Anything can possibly happen. I, I've got to be honest with you, when I read about the score, Cove, that, 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 was, that was interesting and I would say somewhat unexpected. Um, score is obviously in the top 10. Um, I can't think of, um, I mean, I, they have the ability, the capability on their own to do pretty much anything that they choose. I thought it was interesting in, that, in the fact that they just recently announced uh, a reorganization within the reinsurance a property casualty of a non-life reinsurance, you know, to perform a capital partners union. I think that that's part of this evolution of traditional trying to align itself more closely with alternative and also with traditional players trying to find ways to take advantage of insure tech opportunities. So that, that wasn't surprising, but SCORE, given its size, its scale, its relevance, they have the capability to, to take those types of initiatives and to execute on them and to, and to be successful. Smaller players, you know, with, you know, I don't want to say that they're capital constrained because everybody has, I would say, as far as I know, everybody is pr probably in uh, what I would say is an excess capital or capacity position. But again, it's more difficult for them to, to, to lever those types of opportunities. Uh, they have external shareholders um, and they're probably under more pressure from um, a profit perspective. And um, they're probably a little bit more cautious in terms of taking on additional expenses to execute on those types of strategies just because of what it means for the bottom line. It's not, it's, you can't diversify that type of expense away as easily. Just, just a quick comment on the, on the economic logic of, of Covea score. In a market where you've got those depressed returns and return on equity being uh, uh, you know, in the numbers that, that Bob's talked about, the, the economic logic of, of putting together two groups like that brings a, under Solvency 2, would bring a reduction in required capital because of the diversity of the two businesses. So in effect, you could run both businesses on a, a smaller combined capital base and therefore improve the ROEs. And, and I think that is part of, the, part of the factor behind some of the M&A activity. I don't think it was the principal factor, but if you looked at AXA uh, and the Excel acquisition, under Solvency 2, AXA's primary capital requirement is to do with asset risk. You, you add a, a, a big chunk of liability business, liabilities to the, biz, to the business, you diversify access overall capital requirement. So 
So there's economic logic in some of the, driving some of the M&A activity. To, to follow up on Bob's point, historically the industry had fallen into the trap of Me Too acquisitions where you know, their competitors did it, so they had to do it to compete. The ones that we've been seeing are, are not that. They're strategically focused and there's a, dis, a, a direction and an end game to what they're doing. So we don't see that foolish activity happening. Okay. I don't think Mr. Kessler was best pleased. He <laughs> almost could have ruined his Monte Carlo, but I'm sure he's <laughs> rebounded. Um, next question. Hi, thank you. Uh, in this year's annual letter, Warren Buffett again talked about the likelihood of a $400 billion event and how ill-equipped the industry is to deal with that. Is that something at all that factors into your consideration? How low are the odds of something like that happening? And how well prepared would the industry be for a mega event, I think he called it? Thank you. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously, we, we perform stress, uh, stress tests at various return periods. Um, and we try to look out on the tail. Uh, and for companies who have a weaker capital position or a capital position that uh, um, is um, the, the, the fall off in the tail and, 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 and how quickly that happens is, is a concern to us. And um, we do try to have a dialogue with organizations around what, how they would manage that severe tail event. Um, and it factors into our evaluation of their enterprise risk management. Um, 400 billion is a, is a pretty significant event. Uh, I'm not gonna argue with Mr. Buffett um, because generally he's gen you know, well informed. I mean, the probability is very, very remote. Um, and um, every, every organization is different. Uh, the risk characteristics are different. So it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a dialogue that we have uh, with very, very specific in amount of information and very specific issues for the rated entities. Um, I don't know how else to, to answer that. I mean, the, the, the the, the, when you look at the market today in terms of its liquidity, it's tremendously liquid. I mean, if you look at the asset side of the balance sheet, uh, the durations are relatively short. They're generally high quality. Um, there's excess capital at, at, for most rated entities. Um, we've never seen a $400 billion event, so I am certain that there will be surprises around it if it happens, but I think we're gonna have to wait and see how it plays out. And, and what that event is, is obviously undetermined. Um, the insurance industry just went through a major event in 17, and capital was not an issue, so it'll be replenished. Uh, a $400 billion event may have more implications to the other or industries outside insurance that the world will have to grapple with at that point. Um, we all know with all, no disrespect to modeling, once you start going further out in the tail, there's estimates on estimates and what that would actually be is, is too difficult to determine. Perhaps with, with some degree of certainty, that probably would cause a hard market. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anybody else? This one, uh, Mark? Hi, Mark Beckers, uh, Tiger Risk. Um, you talked a lot about the alternative capital and how that's going to change possibly the way uh, traditional reinsurers think about the market. I hear, I heard not that much about uh, data and technology. And do you think that the reinsurance market is ready for you know a big change in terms of doing business in a different way? Well, I think that you know. I I think the reinsurance, you know, people talk about insure tech, and I think that insure tech opportunities, as that relates to reinsurance, are somewhat limited. I think that insure tech is more focused on primary and, what op and the opportunities to get closer to the client and make it more efficient for the, for the agent, the broker, and the wholesaler to basically distribute that pro product to the ultimate insured. So when you think about reinsurers, I mean, I think they're pretty well sophisticated already in terms of the modeling capabilities that they have, uh, in terms of um, you know, their pricing uh, 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 infrastructure and, and, and risk management. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about blockchain and how that could bring efficiency 
uh, to, the, to, 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 to the reinsurance um, uh, cycle of distribution. Um, I think that there's a lot of um, doubt that it will ever be successful only because you have to get cooperation uh, across a, a broad uh, you know, number of, of reinsurers and I don't know if, they've, if, they're, if that level of cooperation is really there yet, uh, but it's a possibility. Um, so I tend to think of reinsurers as being pretty, pretty sophisticated and far advanced in terms of their, cap and their, their data and their technological capabilities. And in some respects, they've been ahead of the primary sector. Um, brokers have to play a role in that too. Um, so that, that's, I, that, could be, that could be an opportunity or a challenge, depending on the degree of cooperation that, that we're able to, 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 to get out of, out of the exercise. So, um, I, you know, I don't... Okay. No, no. Um, time probably for one, one or two more. So, one down there. Yeah. Uh, maybe a question on reserves. You talked about capital, but reserves. How has reserve adequacy developed over the last five years? And do you think that reinsurers allow for a rise in inflation, which you had touched upon? Yeah, um, good question. Very good question. Um, I, I personally feel that reserving is thinner now than it, than it ever has been, and I think that that's just a logical conclusion to come to, given the market dynamics. Uh, pricing has eroded. Um, and, um, you know, people, actuaries tend to look back, maybe more so than looking forward. Uh, inflation has been very, very muted, so we've become, I'm going to use the word complacent, in terms of uh, possibly considering, you know, what a rising inflationary environment might need for reserves. I do think that it was interesting, you know, when you look back, you know, we've had quarter after quarter after quarter, Pretty, pretty consistently across the broad base of reinsurers saying favorable reserve development, favorable reserve development, favorable reserve development. We're starting to see more one-offs of adverse development. So I kind of think that that's a little bit of a warning sign. I will say this, that when we talk about reserves with our rated carriers, everyone tells us that they're putting a margin in. Uh, but that's easier said, I think, than done. And then there's the question of whether or not it's an adequate margin if they are indeed doing what they're saying. I would think that I, I personally believe that given you know what we're starting to see, it, it, there's there's probably going to be more issues around that question going forward than there have been historically. But yeah. again, I, mean, I, yeah, I have a, a view that claims inflation is leveraged to general inflation, and we, so we've had that benefit of very low inflation across all, all major markets for a long period of time. So claims inflation has. has trailed away as well. As inflation picks up, I think claims inflation is, is leveraged to that. I'm, I'm struggling to prove it mathematically and get the data, but certainly the circumstantial evidence points to claims inflation generally running higher than general inflation over the, over the long term. So I, I think there is that, that there will be a, a potentially a delayed effect as, as claims inflation seeps through. And, and the assumptions that you make on reserving, or the, the assumptions you make about inflation in your reserving is absolutely key for longer tail lines of business. So I, I, I share Bob's view that I, I suspect reserving is probably at it generally across the market at, at its thinnest in terms of, of what, what margin there remains. You know, and the concern is going to be as the global economies start to stabilize and, and hopefully see growth, if you don't have the underwriting discipline, mm -hmm. you may be getting the growth, but if you're not getting your reserves to your, where, where they need to be, you're going to have that dynamic where you're going to have problems in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, the counter to that is interest rates are rising, so that hopefully that translates into a little bit more investment income, which helps to absorb the adverse development from the underwriting side. And then the other potential positive, I mean, it's kind of hard, but it could actually mean better underwriting discipline going forward and more pronounced improvement in pricing going forward. So, you know, how it all comes together is anybody's guess, but there are, you could try to be, be optimistic and say that maybe that, that's what the market needs to, in order to move it forward and move it forward in a positive way. There was just an article out today by Swiss Re saying Western insurance markets in Japan need somewhere between 5 and 9% rate increases to justify profitability in the future. So the need for rate can't be overlooked because of better interest rates and a better economy. Okay, anybody else? Sir, one at the back.
uh, Milan Simic, AI Worldwide. So I just wanted to offer a, a, an insight from the model world about your comment on the 450 billion uh, dollar cash. It was, it was, it was, it was, four, it was 400. <laughs> for 400. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we have actually blogged on this topic, and the blog was called Why Warren Buffett is Almost Certainly Wrong About Cat Risk. If you remember, the 400 billion was put at around 50 year return period. In, in our model world, we put that at way above the 100 year yeah. return period. And the so. big question is whether that 400 or 400 plus billion number comes from one single event or from multiple events, because what we saw in both 2011 and 17 yep. were multiple catastrophes. Yep. We also heard numbers that were mentioned that 250 billion would be enough to turn the market. Well, our calculations show that 250 billion aggregate number has a return period of around 43 years. So some numbers to think about. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And we know you guys always get it right. So. <laughs> <laughs> I guessed. <laughs> um, anybody else? Or we'll, um, well, well, while you're, you're thinking, I'll just say um, a couple of things to conclude. One is actually to um, let you know about a couple of events coming up. We're holding a, a, another reinsurance briefing, uh, I guess next month, will be in Bermuda on October the 16th. Bob, you may well be appearing again. I'm, I'm not sure if it's I in your so. diary. Yeah. But October the 16th at the Hamilton Princess. I think you can register on the, uh, the website now. And um, back in London, we've got our annual uh, European briefing in uh, November. So one, one in October, one in November, if you want to hear more from uh, AM Best uh, and other guest speakers. So probably in the absence of any other questions, we'll, we'll wrap up there. Many thanks for your, uh, your attendance as, as ever. I hope you have a great, great few days. As I mentioned at the beginning, slides on the website tomorrow and be emailed out. Uh, and we're located two floors up uh, for the next three or four days if you want to call by. Thanks very much. Thank you.